Violet Stage Walk. She is representing the Northern Chumash Tribal Council. She was born in Avila Beach. Violet has deep Avila Beach. Violet has deep roots in the San Luis Obispo area. She and her family are the designees of the proposed Chumash Heritage National Marine Sanctuary. Violet is a member of Slow Progressives. I want to thank Slow Progressives for um, their work in helping us. Now, Violet is a member of Slow Progressives, and she's an alumni of Emerge California. Woo! Um, and a 35th district delegate to the Democratic Party. Haku, haku. That's the Shumash word for good morning. I love to hear our language being spoken on our land. And from the bottom of my heart, I am grateful for you to all have chosen our land to hold your first annual convention. And what I'd like to do is have you all stand and sing a welcoming song with me. Hey, 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 on you walk. Hey, 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 on you walk. Hey, 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 on you walk. Hey, on you walk. Hey, on you walk. Hey, hey. really to be here. Um, our people have lived in this land for 15,000 years or, or as long as we can remember in our past. Um, our ancestors, um, we talk about our stories and the land that we walk on, the birds, the animals. We look out into the ocean and we see the waves sparkle and we think of our ancestors who lived here before us and who have taken care of this place for us. And it's, um, it's, it's my heart here. This is the, the center of our community. This is where we come from. We don't know any other land. And unfortunately, the cost of living here is getting really, really expensive, right? And, and, I, and I wish, you know, I could, um, I could tell you that there's, there's more of us, but really, there's very few of us left. And because of all of the, the things that we have gone through, all of this, different occupations and different genocides and different struggles that we've all gone through, there's very few of us left that, have, that are from the Northern Chumash. And it's a miracle that we're here. And our ancestors would be proud to know that what we've gone through, that we could even be here today. And when I say there's a few of us left, we're talking a handful of people. When this village of Avila used to have 20,000 people living in it, and our village in Morro Bay used to have 10,000 people in it. And when I talk about pre-contact, you know, our people lived here. One, one, um, one recording um, said that there was as many grizzly bears as people. And I think as many grizzly bears as people. And we lived in harmony together. And we, co we, we lived and we had a relationship and they didn't eat us, they ate, you know, the fish. <laughs> you know, and my dad tells me stories about when he was young and he could walk across San Luis Creek on fish, on steelhead and on salmon. And when he could walk from our house in Sea Canyon here and down to the beach in Avila on trees. And he could just walk along the oak trees, in the trees, all the way to the beach. And we could come back with, with big, huge abalone shells and big, huge tuna and sturgeon. And, and we had this, this bounty here. And you can imagine how our ancestors thrived here. And it is my, um, one of my callings in my lifetime to be able to protect this place and be able to speak for it. And it wasn't until I was about 12 years old that I really learned what um, resistance meant. And I learned from our elders who occupied Point Conception and who occupied Alcatraz and who were at the occupation on, um, at uh, South Dakota. And I learned about what it means to resist and what it means to protest and what it means to stand up for your people and your ancestors. And so, I welcome all of you here to our land, and I am asking you to um, remember us 
and I'm asking the Progressive Caucus to think about us in a way, you know, going forward and remember, you know, the struggles that we have as indigenous people to, um, to overcome, to be able to be standing here today with you guys. And it's a blessing for me to be a part of the Slow Progressives. If it wasn't for them, I wouldn't be involved in politics. They're the ones that came and tapped my shoulder and said, can you do this? And I said, okay. <laughs> and then we, just, then we just start showing up, right? That's what we do. If I didn't know anything about what an ADEM was, and I didn't know anything about the Central Committee. And, but, but when we ran and we won, thanks to Heidi and to Nick and the great group of Slow Progressives, we've changed the face of our community, and it, it's all about showing up. And one of the things I'd like to ask is that um, going forward, I could talk for a lot longer, but somebody's giving me like a key card over here. <laughs> I just think in protocol that Native people don't get key cards. I just think about that. Everybody has their one thing that they can do. And, and, and I can support every single one of you with my name and my, my time or my money. But what I'm going to ask you to do is to, when you leave here, to look into the proposed Chumash Heritage National Marine Sanctuary. And the Marine Sanctuary would close the gap between Monterey County and Channel Islands National Marine Sanctuary. We are, we have gone through the entire designation process and we are ready to be funded. We are in NOAA's inventory. We are completely finished with our process. All we need is funding. So if you keep that in the back of your mind, and you know um, Monterey Bay Marine Sanctuary was funded under a Republican president. Yeah. It was funded by Leon Panetta. He added it to a bill. He funded it under a Republican president. And so I, I want to say our designation is going to run out before November 2020. And so keep in your mind and in your heart, the Chumash Heritage National Marine Sanctuary would be the first indigenous-led and controlled national marine sanctuary in the nation right here. I have the honor and privilege of introducing the mayor of SLO, the mayor of San Luis Obispo, Heidi Harmon, and I want to read her bio before she comes up here. Uh, Heidi Harmon has been an advocate for positive solutions to local and global challenges in San Luis Obispo for the past 30 years. Now as mayor, she brings fresh ideas to local government to support the people's vision for SLO. She is a social, climate, and gender justice leader and is committed to implementing creative housing solutions in the hopes of increasing inclusivity and diversity. She believes in strengthening relationships with, within the diverse voices of slow residents, re revitalizing the unique culture of their downtown, and enhancing community resilience through energy efficiency and sustainability in our changing climate. She is a reform-minded leader, passionate about keeping the voices and concerns of local residents at the forefront of everything she does. This is great. I just want to start with so much gratitude for all of you for being here, showing up, coming from uh, places near and far to join together in the Central Coast here. And I just want to welcome you to San Luis Obispo and extend also gratitude to Violet and the Chumash peoples for hosting us here on their lands. We're very grateful for that. So, we've been doing the work. Right? All the people yeah. in this room and the people around the state, we have been doing the work and we are having success. We are winning, right? We are seeing what is possible when we get progressives into office, right? Mm -hmm. And what is possible when we turn protests into policies, right? Because we are actually doing it. We are creating the future that we deserve. And there's a lot of examples around that, uh, uh, with that around the state. I just wanted to highlight a few. Kevin DeLeon leading the state to 100% carbon-free energy by 2045. Yeah. Right? Senator, state Senator Hannah Beth Jackson um, offering several bills to block expansion of offshore oil drilling. Yeah. 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 State, yeah. Really important. State Senator Ben Allen and Assemblywoman Lorena Gonzalez, who introduced legislation to phase out the sale and distribution of single-use plastics by 2030. 
LA Supervisor Sheila Kuhl, who led the effort on the Board of Supervisors to fund and launch the Clean Power Alliance CCA this year. <laughs> and California Congress members Jimmy Gomez and Representative Ted Lieu, who introduced Climate Solutions Act of 2019, a bill that establishes a national renewable energy standard to drive the United States towards 100% renewable energy by 2035. Yeah. <laughs> And if that's not enough, right here in the beautiful city of San Luis Obispo, um, since I became mayor, we have made climate action one of our major city goals for the first time in our city's history, created a CC, or joined a CCA uh, program, um, amongst uh, many, many other climate initiatives, um, and working to increase more affordability here in our community, another California statewide level challenge that we're facing. And in some ways, as important, of course, is working to be become a more inclusive and equitable community. So we have a welcoming city here, which is a sanctuary city status, where we do not um, pursue anyone on the basis of their documentation status here in the city of San Diego. Everyone is welcome here. And one of the things I'm the most proud of that makes me the most emotional, actually, and I cry almost every time, is that we, um, since I've been mayor, we never, ever have celebrated a Columbus Day, and now we're only <laughs> in ce celebrating yes. Indigenous People Day. Yes. What happens when you turn protests into policies, yes. and this is what it is to be a progressive, right? Two years ago, or a little bit more than two years ago, uh, we, this country, not the people in this room, but this country really inaugurated a moment, a time of hate, right, and bigotry. But the people in this room and the people across this country have together and instead inaugurated a, a loving commitment to making our cities and our state and our world a better place. We've inaugurated a resistance and a persistence in this moment, we are called to stand up beyond the borders of our own communities and stand with marginalized people everywhere across this country. And this is what it is to be a progressive. It's when the federal administration tries to take a woman's right to choose, we stand with women and girls everywhere to ensure that right. Yes. When the administration wages war on working people, we stand with workers for a living wage and union protection. Yeah. After people of color or immigrants or anyone due to their marginalized status, we stand up and stand with them to protect the civil rights of all people. Yeah. It's when they try and tell us that the biggest threat to our humanity, our changing climate is a hoax, that we stand up and fight to protect the planet and the future itself. We are turning marches into a movement, and this is what it is to be a progressive. Good. Woo! Let's get serious. Our changing climate is moving in a direction with a diminishing possibility for a living future. The federal administration continues to cater to fossil fuel interests by denying the basic reality of climate science. And with this pursuit of an anti-science policy, they are endangering every single thing we love. Wrong. Every single one of us and the future generations. And it is way past time for elected officials to say no no to the profits of fossil fuel companies, and yes to the people, and yes to the planet. Oh. Oh. We are here to inaugurate a unified vision of government that is based on the principles of equity, justice, and civil rights for all. But we are not here to just resist. We are not here just to say no. We came here to say yes, right? Yes to Medicare for all. Yes. Yes, yes to reproductive rights. Yes. Yes to this call and response. Yes. Yes, yes to a living wage. Yes. Yes to affordable housing. Yes. Yes to paid family leave. Yes. Yes to college for all. Yes. Yes to equal pay for equal work. Yes. Justice. Yes. yes. Yes to gender justice. Yes. Yes to recognizing the fundamental human rights of every person, regardless of status.
status, and yes, 100% yes, to a livable planet and the Green New Deal. Yes! Yeah. 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 California and the world a more just, equitable, and sustainable and loving place for everyone, and there is no more time to wait or be silent. Right. It is time to stand together like our lives depend on it, because yes. it is yeah. true! We are here today to demand that the focus of our country shifts away from militarism, racism, and misogyny, and wealth inequality, and instead move our focus towards supporting the working people who have built this country and have built this world. Right? Yes. <laughs> it's time for a multiracial, multi ethnic, multi gender, multi generational, and multi denominational movement. A movement of movement, movements. We are turning marches into movements and protests into policies, and this is what it is to be a progressive. Yeah. Yeah. The have the vision and the strategy and the political will to create a more democratic society that puts the long-term sustainability over the short-term economic uh, the long-term sustainability of everyone over the short-term economic gains of a very, very few. And while this movement bridges progress and pragmatism, it demands that we dig deeper into our own values, into everything that we do. The revolution starts here in this room, right? And it also starts here in our own hearts. The revolution starts from within. And it starts with a love, love of justice, love of fairness, love for our fellow human beings, and love for equality for all. Love is the greatest act of resistance. Love inspires us to build a bridge between conviction and compassion, between criticism and kindness, a bridge rooted in truth and reason. Love leads us always to support people over profits and calls us to courage. It is your courage that will lead the way to the revolution, and it's your courage that will lead the way to the evolution. It is time for a revolution led with, led with love and a courage that, to stand together to make this country and this state and this world united around a vision of equality and freedom. And that's why we're here together this weekend. We're here together this weekend not just to look at the problems, but to be an integral part of the solutions. And as we turn protests into policies, we double down. We're doubling down on being more in love with the solutions than we are with the fight. And that is what it is to be a progressive. So I'm taking off my MC hat for a moment here and putting on a, a speaker hat because I want to share with you a little bit about the history of the California Progressive Alliance, how we got uh, this idea going and how we got to where we're at today and, and how we'll keep it moving. So let me um, begin by uh, saying I am the former mayor of Richmond, California. Yeah. 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 A city across the way from San Francisco, a very diverse city, majority of people of color, with a major oil refinery, the Chevron yeah. Yeah. Richmond yeah. Yeah. Refinery in the city. Uh, many of you know that I um, that I ran for lieutenant governor. I uh, yeah. well, we did, Thank you. Thank you. Well, we did get past the primary. We did some magnificent work organizing. I had so many wonderful relationships with all of you and met with so many wonderful groups throughout the state. Um, and I shared the Richmond story because a lot of people find this so impressive. Um, and it's impressive only because we formed an alliance called the Richmond Progressive Alliance and we collectively worked to transform our city and elect corporate free council members and corporate free mayor. Um, and that is how we got things done. We were able to beat Chevron on the electoral field, for example. <laughs> Millions of dollars to try and defeat us. <laughs> millions, millions of dollars um, on the on the electoral field, and um, we also managed to uh, up the minimum wage to fifteen dollars an hour. Um, we, we are working class community. We know our our uh, community needs a fifteen dollar an hour 
wage at least. It's going to go up a CPI increase every year, but um, you know we want to actually have it go up much, much higher and much faster. Yes. Um, we also got over $100 million in additional taxes from Chevron. We um, limited their pollution. We sued them in court for a major fire and other incidents that they had at the refinery. We also are a sanctuary city. We joined a community choice energy program. Um, we defended our public schools and um, did so many wonderful things. Many of you have heard me speak about this before. And so people started wanting to know um, how they could do something similar. And so throughout my campaign, I talked about um, how you too in your community can form a local progressive alliance. And about, uh, there's actually about 15 that at least have got, gotten started, some of them well along their way. A couple were actually started um, before this campaign effort that we ran talking about the Richmond story. Um, so um, I've since continued to uh, reach out to communities and encourage local progressive alliance building. And we have many representatives from local progressive alliances here today. And during lunch today, we will have some of those representatives say a few words um, about the successes and challenges that they have encountered in building such an alliance in their city and community. Um, now, you know, we're all these passionate, strong, hardworking activists. I, I knew we were that in Richmond because we were able to come together and, and do so much work. And throughout my campaign, I saw it, saw so many of you and so many more um, having that same passion and will and, and hardworking ethic uh, in terms of your activism. So um, after the primary, we said we can't just let these connections and these relationships that we have built um, just, you know, kind of lay uh, un unattended or unnurtured. Um, we realized that people tend to be working in, in their own areas, um, either on issues um, or on, you know, building their own local alliances. Um, but we, we thought we needed to have something that brought us all together statewide. So we decided to form a group and we thought, hey, you know, the Richmond Progressive Alliance name worked. Other Progressive Alliances have a similar name. So why don't we just call it the California Progressive Alliance? Yeah. So that's what we did. And uh, we, we wanted to keep this momentum going from the campaign and keep those solid connections um, nurtured. Uh, with, among each other. And so um, we decided to turn my website, my campaign website, into the California Progressive Alliance website, my Facebook into this, you know, CPA as we call ourselves, um, website. And I uh, used my email contacts, you know, the, the 100,000 plus con uh, contacts we have to, you know, keep this momentum going and the social media contacts and so. That's what we uh, started doing in really right after the <laughs> primary in June. And, and we decided to hold a founding convention because obviously we're all, all of us who are here today are founders of this CPA. Um, we did form an interim steering committee um, because we had to have uh, you know, a group of people to plan this convention and that's what we've been doing in recent months. Um, I want to share with you the mission, and it's on the front page. I'm only going to read the first paragraph of your program, just so you have a little sense of uh, what is the foundation of, of um, what we're all about. So the, the CPA is a statewide, independent, volunteer network of progressive individuals and organizations united by our shared belief that a better California is possible by reclaiming our government from the corporate interests that have overshadowed the voice of the people. Together, regardless of party affiliation or no party affiliation, that's how we based the RPA, you know, um, we didn't uh, have uh, one party as the uh, focus. Um, and that's what other local progressive alliances are doing. So that's what our statewide alliance is doing. And we seek two, and we have like four tenets. One is to elevate progressive ideas throughout the state. Two, continue to promote the creation of local political alliances and people-powered coalitions to enact progressive change in local government. And three, to support corporate free progressive candidates. That's really, really important. No corporations have dominated the electoral field for too long. And 
course, to support progressive issue-based electoral campaigns and to wield our collective power to lobby the state legislature on current and future legislation, as well as research and write new model legislation. So that's basically, there's a little bit more, so you can read that on your own. Um, but basically, that's the, the foundation from which we have uh, formed this group. And we, we know that we have the will. Um, we just have to put it into practice. So I would like to, uh, before I continue and make some, a few more comments, I would like to ask the members of the Interim Steering Committee to stand up, maybe come up here for a moment. Um, I'm calling your names. Mel Lou, Melanie Lou, Socrates Cruz, Lauren Steiner, Parker Mankey, Ankur Patel, Leslie Simon, Mark Bender. I also, a member of the Interim Steering Committee, is Adriel Hampton, who, due to unforeseen circumstances, could not make it today. So, Adriel uh, and everyone else that I just mentioned, and myself, were part of the Interim Steering Committee. Uh, Paul Kilkenny was the Assistant Treasurer. So, uh, this organization is an organization of individual members. Um, we're democratic and we're inclusive. Um, some have called this an umbrella organization. I like what Jeff Newman of um, what is it, the movie, it's uh, Way Out, Voters In, um, called it an upside down umbrella organization because we work from the ground up. We don't have a hierarchy. So we're an upside down umbrella organization. We're unique in that we're corporate free and we're real progressives and we don't let party get in our way. We, we stand together based on our values. We're also an organization that has ally organizations that are um, part of our group that are um, they're, you know, not members, but they, we want to connect all the ally organizations to um, share their issues and we can help. So when an ally organization has an issue, we can spread it to all the allies. And if there's an emergency alert, we're going to um, help to spread that among all the allies and all our members. I'd like to read the confirmed ally organizations and many more. We welcome to come. Some of you are having to uh, go to your organizations and get a vote. And please, uh, please become an ally organization. Email me, gaildirect at gmail.com if you want the sign-in sheet. Uh, we'll be reaching out a lot uh, in a continuous basis as well. So these are the organizations. Peninsula Peace and Justice Center, Human Agenda, South Bay Progressive Alliance, California Public Bank Alliance, Divest LA, Revolution LA, Public Banking LA, Romero Institute, L Lakota People's Law Project, Green Power, Green Party of Contra Costa County, Our Revolution Long Beach, Our Revolution Santa Clarita Valley, Our Revolution Watsonville, Our Revolution North County San Diego, <laughs> Movement for a People's Party, The Incorruptibles, Richmond Progressive Alliance, San Diego Progressive Alliance, Healthcare for All California, Slow Progressives Democratic oh, hell yeah. Party, PBA California, and so many more, like I said, will be coming. So I also just want to um, make a few more comments as um, my time is up. Um, first of all, we know that conflicts will, will occur as in every any organization. Democracy can be messy, but we need to be democratic and have an inclusive process, and we will prevail. Um, various organizations, we know are represented in this room from our revolution to DSA to Green Party to Peace and Freedom Party. Um, Issue-based organization, democratic clubs, movement for a people's party, etc. Um, coming together as individual activists and ally organizations is how we build political power. And it's that political power that will assure we cannot and will not be ignored. We need to connect in person, by phone, on social media, um, in every, every way possible. That is how we will not be ignored. And we can do this. We can, um, we can, we're in good company with each other, right? Um, we know that there's a huge task in front of us. Um, but with our unity, we can make it happen. We can do this because we have the political will. We can do this because we have the principles. And we can do this 
because we are not the corporations or the billionaires. We are the people. That's right. So, <laughs> final statement. Final statement. The time is urgent, but we must approach this calmly to do it right. And uh, but we do know we're in a state of climate emergency. We're in a state of growing obscene wealth inequality. But we're also in a state of hope because more and more people understand that capitalism is failing us. But we will not fail each other. Thank you. is the chief attorney in the San Francisco Public Defender's Office. He previously, yeah, he previously served as president of the San Francisco Board of Supervisors while a member of the Green Party. And, and while in office, he was the main sponsor of measures that created the highest minimum wage in the country and which yeah. instituted ranked choice voting for yeah. local elections. Yeah. <laughs> Although his... Um, Sure, I'm following myself here. Um, although the campaign for his campaign for mayor in 2003 fell short of victory against now Governor Gavin Newsom, he is credited with defending progressive values and mobilizing voters disenchanted with politics. In 2005, he co-founded a civil rights law firm, Gon Gonzalez and Lay LLP, and was trial. Counsel in a case that won a punitive damages verdict in in um, in federal court. I'm sorry, I have to get one more paper. This is my first. I pitch uh, because Adriel couldn't make it. I had to step in here as an MC. So excuse me. He won a punitive damages verdict in. in um, federal court against an elected district attorney who was abusing his powers. And we also know he served as uh, Ralph Nader's vice hey. president in the I was reflecting on the fact as I heard the speakers that I entered politics two decades ago as a candidate for district attorney in San Francisco. And I was uh, working in the public defender office. Uh, I had no uh, leadership position in the office. I had never um, even uh, supervised anybody other than an intern. And I decided to run for the top law enforcement position in San Francisco. And at the time, I, I articulated a position uh, against the death penalty in favor of prosecuting police officers who committed crimes. <laughs> go after landlords and pretextual evictions and all kinds of things. And 20 years ago, there were Democratic parties that when I went to speak to them, they basically laughed at me wow. because I thought that it was okay to be against the death penalty or support gay marriage or whatever progressive ideals that we now take for granted that you cannot be a legitimate candidate even within the Democratic Party and believe that you're going to have a progressive base without supporting those ideals. Um, I, I ran for Board of Supervisors the following year uh, in district elections. Districts in San Francisco have about 80,000 people. As you heard, I worked on things like the minimum wage, like ranked choice voting. Also worked on community land trust. Uh, worked on uh, talking about a municipal bank. And when I ran for mayor in 2003, again, the newspapers made fun of me because I thought San Francisco could have its own municipal bank and because I thought we could harness tidal energy uh, as part of a plan to take over the power grid in San Francisco. It, you know, so much has changed. The context is so different as we get together now and try to sort things out. As a president of the Board of Supervisors, I supported a member of the Communist Party running for treasurer who also shared my views on the municipal bank against the Democratic <laughs> incumbent. He was not elected, unfortunately, and uh, I was told numerous times that I would pay a political price for that kind of um, endorsement decision. Um, one of, the, one of my takeaways from 
my time as a candidate holding office is it's actually not that hard to make political change. Uh, Gail did it in Richmond. Uh, Mike Feinstein, who's in the back, the mayor of Santa Monica for many years, yeah. did it there. And there's one fundamental thing that you have to adhere to, which is you don't, you cannot care whether or not you're out of office. Yeah. That's it. That's the only rule your yeah. candidate has to believe in. Because if you're not scared, yeah. then you can make good decisions. And yeah. the only decisions... <laughs> the, the only decisions I regret uh, turn out to be the ones that I, I made uh, because I didn't have good information. It's not because I was scared of a developer who was going to spend money against me and things like that. So, in reflecting on being here, you know, the big question is why are we here? And I think that, for me, answering the question aside from Gail you know, asking me, uh, I still remember the Richmond Progressive Alliance meeting in January 2004, getting a call, I think, from Peter Pomego saying, Hey, Gail's doing this thing over in Richmond. We gotta go. Um, but you know, people people are suffering, right? The yeah. inequality, the, the wealth inequality is widening. We have, you know, hundreds of thousands of people in prisons. We have uh, job opportunities. Low-paying work is out there, but not real job opportunities, and certainly not educational opportunities. And so, as we try to find our way into a path of success, you know, the question is, how is this organization going to be different than any other organization? How are we going to inspire people that have given up on politics or people that just don't believe in politics anymore to care about it? Uh, I've been uh, excited to see some of the efforts by folks in this room, the DSA and others, who have gotten people believing that there can be change within the Democratic Party in this way. Um, I, I come out of the Peter Camejo camp that was opposed to fusion, but our effort in the Green Party uh, hasn't exactly made it. Uh, so, you know, we haven't won, won, won the fight, so I now welcome any possibility at any change, and, and I hope that we can do it in a coalition. Good evolution. Yes. In order to make people believe in what we can do, though, we have to have victories. We have to show people that we can change their lives. We can uh, in, in, you know, improve their quality of life. We can pay them more money for the work they do. Um, and one of the, the ways to do that is we have to uh, support local efforts and change. And here's, here's something that a lot of folks don't realize. When you think about so many of the cities in California, to win a city council race in these cities, often you can do it with less than $10,000. Doesn't take a lot of money to do it. And so if an organization can raise a couple of thousand dollars to help, I mean, you're in effect raising 20% of the effort, and that can be the difference on whether or not a piece of mail goes out or you're printing sufficient you know, content-based information for why people should believe in somebody. So we have to think about, you know, a lot of times people don't give money because they don't have hundreds of dollars to give, but a little bit of money from a lot of people can go a, a long way. I also think, and I had kicked this around when I was in government and regret not having uh, accomplished this, we started beta testing this thing called, um, I think it was called something like good legislation. The idea that there would be a Wikipedia bank or a de depository of good ideas, good, good pieces of legislation that had already been written and used in other jurisdictions. Not just California, even in other parts of the country, so that when some city council person in perhaps a smaller city that doesn't have the staff resources to do all the research and write the law or maybe is confronted by city attorneys that don't want to be supportive, you can sit down and say, well, here are three minimum wage laws. Here's San Francisco's, here's the one in this other city, here's the, you know, and, and, and not start at the 20-yard line, right? You get to start on your opponent's uh, 30 or 40-yard line. You still got a lot of work to do, 
but that's something that shouldn't be too hard to do. And when you find that piece of legislation on certain things like, oh, do you have a cost of living adjustment on a minimum wage measure? Do you uh, apply to businesses with less than five employees or not? Do you, you know, what are some of the considerations and some of the obstacles that you're going to have? Create the good. I want to talk about the importance of going after the foundation of the system, right? If the system isn't working, we've got to change the rules so that it works. In San Francisco, I'll give you a little example. Uh, we had, uh, in effect, a mayoral power that appointed the commissioners, and then to reject a commission appointment, you had to get a supermajority of the board of supervisors, so eight out of 11 board members to reject someone. We rejected a commission appointee and the city attorney, Ted Lakey at the time, came to me and he said, Matt, I've been doing this 25 years. It's the first time an appointment has been rejected. And it was a fellow who had been a, a juvenile probation commissioner who was being appointed to the Public Utilities Commission, had no experience whatsoever. We took the fundamental idea of the mayor getting all the appointments, and we said, well, we'll give you a majority of the appointments, but the, but the others will go to the Board of Supervisors, and all of them have to be approved by a majority of the Board of Supervisors. So you have to get six affirmative votes instead of eight against. This little change has resulted in all kinds of commissioners being rejected in the last 10, 15 years. Tiny, simple, not that big of a deal. And we have to look at things like that on a statewide level. A lot of people are talking about, you know, the Supreme Court, you know, lifetime appointments, that doesn't make sense. In California, let's put term limits on our judicial offices. Yeah. And, and there are all kinds of things. Why are judges allowed, they don't endorse in any political contest, but they're allowed to endorse when one another, that, you know, each of them run for a judicial post. Why, why do we allow that? Let's, let's go after these things. My time is up, so let me just end by saying, you know, these efforts that happen in a lot of cities around, that what this organization will do is when those efforts are happening in cities around California, we can be the eyes and ears that help us understand what's happening somewhere and when it's worthwhile to really get in there and try to lend support. Writing opinion editorials, posting on social media. We should be the bots for our own progressive efforts in these little places, you know, because no city in California is little. When you make changes, in a city of under 50,000 people, under 25,000 people, the rest of the, of the state takes notice. So thank you, thank you. Guys.